sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what comes to mind? So I'm going to, you can give me some, some of, some of your thoughts. What comes to mind when you think of Rasulullah? Anyone? Who's going to start? Messenger, okay, messenger, yes. Messenger. Uh, you can you can criticize anything you want to in, in the class except my writing. I've had the secret aspiration to be a doctor, and the closest I've come to is. <laughs> Exemplar, okay. Exemplar. We have a sister at the back also. You can come in here. Honest character, yeah. You're going in the right direction. MashaAllah, leader, good. You are going in the right direction and you're all wrong. So this is good. Oh, see, he's a merchant, right? Here we go. Merchant, there we go. What else? Quiet. Huh? Quiet. Quiet. Quiet? Yeah. Okay. I was saying the most perfect human being that was Okay, let's see that we'll put that there. Perfect human being, that's right. Well, some of it will fall into this perfect human being, a uh, businessman, who said businessman? Someone said businessman, okay, so that merchant, yeah, businessman. How about, anyone know what that stands for? No idea, huh? Multi-millionaire. Multi-millionaire. Abu Sufyan, by the way, is radiallahu anhu. It's hard for us to say that, but he is a Sahabi also who accepted Islam. When he comes to visit the Prophet وسلم, in Medina after a few years, and obviously no, no, nobody had banks at that time. So when he enters, comes to the door, he looks at the the amount of wealth that was stored there. And he says, man, you've come a long way. You have come a long way. So nobody thinks of Rasulullah as a multi-millionaire. And that's important. It's very important that you, that you focus on this. Why is it that we don't think about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a multi-millionaire? Well, I mean, you can jump in any time you want to. What is that we have a, uh, we've been schooled into having an aversion to wealth. You know what that means, right? <coughs> I mean, we've, we've grown up to say, wealth is not a good thing. It's always been like that. And uh, the texts support that to some extent. They do say some things about that. Wealth is not a good thing. So to identify wealth and the accumulation of wealth with, where is that? What's that? Perfect human being, you see? It, 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 it doesn't strike us. So, and and this, is, this is part of, of this bigger, image we have of Rasulullah, it's almost like, you know, and this is not Rasulullah, astaghfirullah, but you, you, you hope you'll understand what I'm saying here. You know, there's a whole part here that's missing. This is part of, you understand what I'm saying now? There's a whole part of his, of his identity and his persona and his contribution that's missing, that's only half a face. The other half is not there. Because there is this other part of his. So why do you think it is that we we know so much about him, and we know nothing about him. 
anyone. So you know, now you say, all right, if you say Abu Sufyan was amazed at the amount of wealth Rasulullah had accumulated, then obviously, you know, he's, he was a rich man. <laughs> so what is it? Anyone? It was his personal wealth as well. It was. We'll, uh, the, the, why, why do we have a one-dimensional one understanding of who Rasulullah is? Well, I told you one reason is because of our, our aversion to wealth. Personally, we want to accumulate. Jamma, right? We, we want to accumulate. But when we, when we confront ourselves or when we talk to ourselves, then, then we understand that this is not something that, that, that you want to pursue as your life's dream. That's one. The other is the mode of, rec of, of receipt. How did you receive Islam? The mode from, through which you receive Islam will determine your attitude towards Rasulullah. And most of us have received Islam to people who were wealth averse. Lots and lots of stories of great alims, great Sufis and so on. Uh, you know, who would... So there's the story. Let me share the story with you. I don't know who it was, but some, some wali. The Sultan comes to him with a, with a bag full of gold. <clears throat> right? You got it? And then he gives, us, gives this wali, this, this sheikh, he gives him the wealth, the, the gold. So the wali looks at it, he puts it down. Then he takes out his own little pot. And he's got dried peas in there. Got it? And then he offers the sultan this, these dried peas. So obviously you're sitting in the presence of a wali, so you better listen to him. So he says, have some. So he said, okay. So he puts his hand in and he takes some of the peas and he starts chewing. Now what happens to him? What? He chokes. He chokes. So the wali raises his head and says, that's exactly how I, how I choke with what you've given me. Get it now? That's exactly how I choke with what you've given. That, that gives you an image of how we have come to understand Islam over hundreds of years. Right? The other thing you have to know is that Rasulullah is heir to two legacies. One that is purely spiritual and one that is political. And the Quran testifies to this. Whatever I'm telling you might come to you as very strange. Like one of those, those sheikhs that I was speaking about last night, you know. But trust me, it's, it, it, the Quran bears testimony to this. That Rasulullah was heir to a spiritual legacy. And his father, in that regard, is... Who's this? No. No, this is an English of his father. He's heir to this... Who, who is Ibrahim, alayhi salam. He is an heir to Ibrahim alayhi salam. The other is that he is an heir to his own ancestral grandfather called Qusay. Qusay. Two different traditions. And if you look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sirah with both lenses instead of one, then you would get both of them coming out. But we have been reared, taught, and educated through just one lens. And you know, you have poetry, you have songs, you have all kinds of stuff that celebrates what? Rasulullah's poverty. How, how, have you ever heard Rasulullah was has such a great person, had so much wealth, or you heard Rasulullah was he lived this life of poverty and there were months and months on end when the, the fire in his house was never lit, right? 
Every one of you is, is, is shares in that. And there, but there is this other side. There is this other side. So this is the Ibra Abrahamic tradition. Now I'm going to take you into a section that is speculation, but I want you to keep it at the back of your mind, because as we go along in the days ahead, you can then draw your own conclusions. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa leaves the world, and then you have the, the Khalifas who come, ultimately the Ummah splits in terms of vision. You don't see it that way, but I'm trying, trying to show it to you now. In terms of its vision of what is the role of Islam in this world, it splits into two different visions. Two different, right down here. We'll go back again, but I, I'm going to have to jump up and down. Every, anytime you have a question, please ask. And that is, it comes to two people. Generally, we all side with the one person. And we said the other person was wrong. The difference is that some of, uh, some of us say respectfully, he was wrong. And some of us curse and abuse him. Two different groups. But we don't disagree that he was wrong. You get it? We don't disagree. Who do you think I'm talking about? There we go, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And the other person is? Ali radiallahu anhu. You get it? So down here, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you have the three khalifas, then you have the fourth khalifa, which, whose power is now challenged by Muawiyah. So you have Ali radiallahu anhu, and you have Muawiyah. Now I, my question to you. Who was Muawiyah heir to? You know what heir means, right? Warith. Like who did he inherit from? What, who, which part of the prophetic legacy does Muawiyah represent? No, but in terms of this whole image I've given you now, who does he represent? Qusay. Qusay. That's why you don't, you, you, the only people who speak highly of Muawiyah, this is the irony of it, are non-Muslim economists and historians. Though they don't say bad things about Ali, but they have nothing to talk about him because they're not, in, they're not into spirituality, they're into economics. And they see great accomplishments on the part of Muawiyah. I mean, if you're a Shia, please, you know, give me a chance when this class is over so I can run to my car. <laughs> I mean, if you have to ask some of the Shia who was a, a, a bigger, uh, who, was, who was more devilish, Iblis or Muawiyah, they probably have difficulty in telling you. Right? We have a more balanced view. But we too believe that Ali was on the right and Muawiyah was on the wrong. We're not talking about the Ali-Muawiyah fight. But we're talking about two understandings of what the future of Islam should be. Should it be what it became, which is it gave us a really good legacy. If you, that's why economists and historians speak so highly of him. It's because he, he changed the way the Muslim Islamic political system was run and boom he turned a garden in the front of your house a small garden in the front of your house he turned it into an entire massive farmland that's Moabia I know you're having difficulty finding something good about him but you know give him some time Ali on the other hand, radiallahu anhu, he rep, he is a continuation of the, of the divine message. He is a continuation of the divine message. You should, in your own privacy, ask yourself, what would the world have looked like? Little exercise for you. What would the world have looked like if Muawiyah had given in and Ali became the Khalifa of the entire Ummah? Because at that time they split. What would the world have looked like? Very interesting question. Very interesting question. 
So this, this beginnings that we have, they are talking about how something that we look from one direction, when looked at from a, a different direction, gives you a very different picture. So Qusay, let's go back to Qusay now, go back. Way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's great-grandfather. They, they give him credit for inhabiting Mecca. He brought his family there, and then they, they developed a little fam, you know, a household. From that household, you had the beginnings of this empire. That's how it starts. That's how it starts. So whilst the Quran speaks a great deal about the cleansing of the heart, and it speaks about ak ak akhlaq and so on, it also reminds you of what? Of the Quraysh and their victories. And the elephant, remember the elephant? And their travel journeys. That's also part of Nubuwa and Risala. The other, the other thing is that because our Islam has come to us through pious individuals who were ascetic and, and world abnegating, they, they didn't, didn't want to have anything in the world, our focus is, even when we focus on a particular Nabi, for instance, we only focus on one part of that Nabi, not on the other. If I tell you Yusuf, what comes to mind? Yusuf, alayhi salam, quickly. Spiritual, there we go. Nobody talks about minister. Head of the exchequer. And guess what? He actually asked for it. He asked for it. This is a Nabi of Allah. Think about Nabi. Patched clothing, right? Broken cap, broken shoes. No, no, no. Give me control over the treasury. Big, big, big call. This king must have just been struck by this. Wow. Because he was a prisoner. Remember the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. He was a prisoner. He comes out. He's supposed to interpret dreams. So he interprets the dream. That's all the spiritual side to him. And then he says, make me the, the, the head of, the, of, of, your, of your bank. The National Bank. Inni hafizun amin. I am a person who is knowledgeable about these things and I'm trustworthy. I can do this. Let me do it for you. You don't think about a Nabi like that. You think about them as being pious people, certainly. But you also think about them as being uh, without anything. Dawood alayhi salam. What comes to mind? Pious man, good man. No. Certainly pious, but certainly good, but also king. Suleiman alayhi salam. His son. So we have been tutored in this way. Which is why we look at Islam and everything as purely spiritual. Purely self -ab world abnegating. And all of our poetry, all of our writings, everything speaks about that. And that's why you have these, this disconnect. Any questions? No? Yes. So is it just one part of the world where all no, no, all Muslims think that. All, all Muslims throughout the history. I mean, I, if I, I could go back to even, you know, the, even today, you know, unfortunately today there's a big f fight going on in the Muslim community about Muawiyah radiallahu anhu in particular. And uh, even those who are very much in support of him would not speak highly of his, of his economic policies and his political accomplishments. They would not speak highly of him. They just say he was a good man. He was a, he was, this is what they say about him. Katib al-Rasul. That he wrote down wahi. Which is absolute nonsense. The man became Muslim on the, on, on, on the last, on, on, when, when, when Makkah was, was liberated. By that time, why he was almost done. But this, you have, to, you have to connect him some way to what? To spirituality. 
So make him the Katib al-Wahi. And you know why he became Katib al-Wahi? Because Abu Sufyan asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give him a good position in your office. That's how he got it. I'm not here to, to run him down. That's not what I'm doing right now. I'm simply saying that even when we speak in his defense, we try to do so by way of spirituality. That this is a man who did this, understand? But he was highly accomplished in other ways. And by the way, one of the most accomplished politicians in Islam, you see, it's hard to use these terms when you're talking about these, these great leaders of Islam. He appointed him governor of Damascus. And who was that? Omar radiallahu anhu. Omar radiallahu anhu appointed Muawiyah. And Omar is an interesting person. You must read Omar. You must read Omar. Omar could, he, had, he, had a br he was brilliant and ignorant so when the wealth came into the country into into the from especially from bahrain a hundred pieces of gold hundred thousand pieces of gold coins do the math <laughs> so abu sufyan is abu, abu, abu huraira radiallahu anhu is trying to explain to him how much a hundred thousand is so omar is counting on his fingers thousand two thousand okay stop do it again a thousand, two thousand. It took him a long while to say, well, what is a hundred thousand? People who didn't see this world suddenly. And now he has to deal with these numbers. So here on the one hand was a person who had no new, uh, uh, what you call numerical literacy. And on the other had an, ability, an amazing understanding of people, personalities, and talent. And he says, you should go there. He totally knew that this was Abu Sufyan's son who held out till the very last moment and so on. But he understood that if you want to go, especially Damascus, he could have sent him to Bahrain. Sent him to Damascus. Because at that time there were two major empires that controlled the world. Anyone know them? The Sasanian, the Persian, and that and the Byzantine. The Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire split into two. Western Roman Empire was the Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire was the Byzantine Empire with its capital where? Constantinople, Istanbul. So its capital there. So these were the two major empires. You must remember them if you want to understand Surah Al-Fil. You must understand, you must remember them if you want to understand the, the, uh, the uh, what you Surah al Rum, uh, Alif Lam Mim, Ghulibat al Rum, Fi Adna al Ard, Wahum Mim Badi Ghalabihim, Sayah Libun. It is amazing how the Quran has just enmeshed his history into it. But we don't pay attention to that because we want to cleanse our hearts and so on. You know, I just gave you my talk about that. So I'm not, I'm not undermining that at all. It's certainly very important. But to get a full understanding of the economics of Islam, you have to understand the politics of Islam. And to get understanding of that, you have to know some of these things. So Qusay comes along and he establishes the family there. There was always a religious presence in Makkah. They didn't quite know what it is. They knew somebody in the past called Ibrahim. And they connected him themselves to him. Right? How that particular center of Tawheed, going back now to the time of Ibrahim, how that became a center of polytheism is unknown to us. We have a story, I'll share that story with you. There was someone who was called Khuzayma. And he uh, would go on these travels. And a very devout person. All of the all of the fitnas that are in, that that are put into religion, they all come from who? Devout people. Devout people. So be careful when you, when you when somebody tells you that this is what that you know you see somebody who is who espouses devotion, it's not always good. So Jose Ma used to go to the north and so on, and he had this longing to take to 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 remember the Kaaba by. 
So he took a piece of rock with him. See that? He took a piece of rock from Mecca with him. Now you understand how this, how this thing can turn into representation and then you start mi mixing things up. So that's how when he went around and they would ask him, what is this? He says, this is the holy house in Mecca and uh, we worship at the holy house and I use the stone when I'm in Syria, for instance, to remember who I, you know, where I come from and the holy house. And that's how this thing grew. By the time of Hosei, it was, it was well entrenched that Mecca was a city in which you can worship Allah. You can worship Hubal. You can worship Lat. You can worship Manat. It was a shopping mall of religions. As long as you pay the dues, you can bring your God in, you get some space, and you can worship. Rasulullah's other later grandfather, he realized that this thing can be monetized. We can monetize it. If we provide, uh, if we provide housing, food, shelter, and so on for the guests, that's what that called in modern terms. That's a tourist industry. So they provided the, 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 the infrastructure for a tourist, tourism industry. And that's how Makkah started to flourish. Number one. The other is that the Arabs were astute business people. Very smart business people. You don't look at them that way, but they were. The Arabs had a country, a landscape that was very arid <coughs> and not conducive to pastoral farming, right? Or to, 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 to uh, what you call land farming. So what do, what do they have left? How do they survive? So it was not just good business instincts, it was also a survival mechanism. You're living in a place that's still barren. Still barren today. So how do you g give life to that particular place? Through trade. And through using this house. So they use this house. Let's stop here. What time is As Asar Adhan? Oh, we have another hour. Okay. So we can decide late, at the end of this class what would be the perfect time, you know, giving yourself half an hour before you start and so on. All of those things we can decide. Because uh, if we start after Asar, we might not have enough time to cover all the material. As it is, I'm jumping uh, through many sections quickly to... No questions so far? Questions give me the understanding that you're not sleeping, that you... Yes, please. So therefore, they ought to also, they should have multiple dimensions. Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, you, you can see it very clearly. Look at all the tafasir they write. It might be in 20 volumes. There are one or two scholars who actually focus on this. So if you look at Maulana Maududi's Tafhim al-Quran, for instance. All right? There you would find that he dedicates a, a great amount. Because ultimately, what he wants to do is combine these two. 
that both him and the Jamaat, uh, the, the Ikhwan al Muslimin, they want to combine these two the spiritual, the worldly together. So his objective is to establish a, 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 a religious political order. So for that, he has to look at this. But if you look at all of the others, whether it's in the Middle East or in South Asia, they're focusing primarily on matters that are spiritual, that matters that have to do with the heart, matters that have to do with the law, and matters that have to do with cleansing the community at large. It doesn't matter who it is. For the most part, that's what they do. Uh, the, 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 the interesting thing, and, and I'll explain to you why is that way. If you look at Fi Zilal al-Qur'an, which is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the tafsir written by Sayyid Qutb, rahimahullah, uh, although he too has, it would seem that he has a background that is in this kind of community building background, the tafsir itself makes no, so, makes no, it's purely spiritual. Purely spiritual. But that's because that was, he comes into, into the ikhwan with a, with preset, a preset mindset, which is why the ikhwan itself, without going into too much detail, has two leaders. On the one hand, you have Hassan al-Banna, and on the other hand, you have Sayyid Qutb. They, and they take the ikhwan into different directions. But, for, but, but every other tafsir just focuses on the spiritual. Yes? Oh, that, yeah, Ali, because of you, two, two groups will go into Jahannam. One because of the overwhelming love for you, and the other for your, the overwhelming hatred for you. No. Not that one? Ammar radiallahu anh. Yeah. You, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't see, that's the point here. The point here is this is a dunya perspective. It's economics, it's money. You know, it's a dunya perspective. Whereas this is, uh, we have been raised with an akhirah perspective. You understand? So, so, so why is it that way? I'm, and, and I'm not saying this to, 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 to necessarily criticize the one or the other. I'm just talking about our orientation. Uh, yes. A model available. Well, one is we are talking about our orientation as Muslims. When I started the the conversation, we were talking about, you know, what you'd call rujhan, which way, which way is your mind set, and so it is. It is anti wealth, anti money. It's it's the general sense that we have. So that's what that's that's the point I was making with regard to the Hanafi school itself. It's interesting that. Whilst Saudi Arabia is, is, is built on, is, is, follows the Hanbali school very, very strictly, the entire economic system of Saudi Arabia, the monetary system of Saudi Arabia, is on Hanafi law. 
And we'll talk about why that is in, in, in perhaps in another in second class or third class. Because then we're going to go into you know, how, how Islam then establish, helps establish these empires and how the schools come about. All right? So this is, <coughs> yeah. I'm listening. Yes, good question, good question. You know, you know, the, uh, that's a good question, Rami. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, what he's pointing out, it's, 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 in fact, it's, it's, it's something to think about. Spirituality is portable. You can move it around easily. I can give it to you, I can give it to you, I can give it to all of you. Um, economics, finance, money management. If you don't have money, you're not going to be interested in the conversation. See? And then if you're, living in, if you're living in Scandinavia, and I'm living in Southern Africa, someone else is living in India, our monetary systems are different. That's an amazing thing about one of the major contributions of Moavia. Brilliant, brilliant. And maybe I shouldn't talk so, 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 so passionately, but it was good, it was good. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so that, that's your point, right? That it's not portable. Economics is not part of it. I mean, your financial situation is, is different from his and it's different from his. But your spiritual conditions and your spiritual challenges are all the same. So that's what makes it, it makes it you know, easily acceptable and, 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 and so on. Anyone here of Lee Kuan Yen? Lee Kuan Yen, yeah? The guy from, from Singapore. The founder of, of, of modern day Singapore. If, if, if I think of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I'm not making that comparison, I'm simply saying that here was, in, uh, in our lifetime, at least in, in, in this particular era, here was an individual who, who is perhaps a best example of what Rasulullah did. If you look at the other side of Rasulullah, if you look at this side, the Qusay side, you take a, if you, look, if you know the Singaporean history, Singapore, was a barren land, nobody wanted it. Malaysia didn't want Singapore. Singapore was part of Malaysia. They said, no, you can go. So they break away, he takes over, and he establishes the most successful city-state the world has ever seen. Enormously successful country. It's a small little island. And the person who benefited least from it financially, least, was him himself. If you want to know where lies our problem, it's in that particular, right there. The only other leader in the Muslim world, unfortunately, who also did not benefit personally. And if I tell you these examples, it shocks you because it says, but it's not a good person. Absolutely not a good person. But he understood full well what Omar ibn Abdul Aziz understood centuries ago. That there is a difference between personal wealth and state wealth. You know, there's so many wonderful stories about Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great grandson of Omar radiallahu anhu. They brought incense to him one day, incense sticks. And so he picked it up and smelling it and all the rest, he said, no, it's very, very good. Then he realized, hey, it's not my stuff. So he throws it down, he asks for some water, he then rinses his hand in that water and he sells the water and puts the money into the Baytul Mal. The only Muslim, pseudo-Muslim, I'm having difficulty calling him Muslim, who actually practiced this to some extent, obviously not to the level of Omar, was Kamal Ataturk. Now you see why I'm choking even mentioning his name. Kamal Ataturk succeeded where hundreds of Muslim leaders failed, separating that which is, belongs to the state from that which belongs to him. And that was unfortunately Muawiyah radiallahu anhu's biggest mistake. His fight with Ali was secondary. 
His biggest mistake is he broke down that wall. He broke down the well, wall that separated wealth of the private individual from the wealth of the state. And from that point onwards, nobody could rebuild it. These are painful moments in our past history, and we have to come to terms with it. And I think I've told you enough. I've, praised, I've been singing the praises of Moabia enough to tell you I have no personal ax to grind with him. These are facts of our own history. So we said Arabia was naturally hostile to, to farming, to uh, pastoral farming. So Arabs used their religious center to enrich themselves. They also realized after a while that we actually located in a very nice place. And here you're going to see my skills as a cartographer. So whether you like it or not, this is a map of which country? It's Arabia, right? Yes, don't. And this is Mecca. And here you have India. And then you have here somewhere Africa. Now you see, and then here you have what? Europe, and now you see how Makkah is located? Perfect. Perfect location. But you have to see it. You have to see it. And you have to know how to monetize it. You have to know how you can turn that into a revenue stream. How do you do that? That's why people respect Jose so much and Abdul Muttalib and Hashim, because they could look into the future. They could see that we can actually enrich ourselves from this. Their tentacles went from Makkah, this desert town, all the way to China. They had Arabs going from here. Well, this is way too high up. It's probably here. All the way from here, all the way to China, because people in Europe loved something from China. What was that? Which you are not allowed to wear, by the way. Silk. You see how that silk weaves into our own theology and our own practice. If you ask a Muslim, tell me about silk. This, here's a good example. Here's a symbol. Tell me about silk. What do you say? This is haram, ya akhi. Right or wrong? Wearing of silk is haram, ya akhi. Because we're looking at it from, but they're looking at it from the other side. Hey, good money to be made here. So they would go to China, pick up the silk, and take it to Europe. And take it to Europe. And they would take stuff from Europe up that way. They had sword, a suyuful hindiya. Can you hear what, what can you? Can you hear that? What word sounds there? Hindi. What kind of swords? Indian swords. That's why they have this connection here. They would go to India, pick up spices, gold, and bring it back. And so th these were, and, and, and I, you, you can appreciate this if you realize we're not talking about, that's why, that's why the, the, the uh, comparison with Singapore is so apt. We're not talking about a, 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 a dynasty here. We're not talking about an empire. You're talking about a city-state, Makkah al a small little place. And people from that part of the world realized the immense assets they had. It's very important for you to understand this. Because it explains how the Quraysh ended up becoming the most powerful tribe in Arabia. Because of people like Qusay. Looked into the future, saw the huge advantage they had in that little city-state. First of all, because of the fact that the Kaaba was there. Says so you have to use that. Then their own location for trade. So they went around trading, 
And then the people of Makkah realized that, man, this is, these people are really successful people. And then finally, which is what, we'll go, we'll go back to the surahs now, this place becomes a conduit, like a highway. So anybody who was coming from, if for some reason, Abyssinia was wealthy. For Abyssinia to get to the north, it would have to go that way. So Makkah becomes important. Makkah becomes like a junction. People have to come to Makkah, drop off their stuff. And until Qusay came around, nobody says, well, you know what? There's a lot of money to be made in this business. What we have been doing for centuries is simply letting people come, use our space and move on. We can start charging them. We can add taxes on them. All of those things start taking place in, in that time prior to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are the three, three ways in which Makkah suddenly becomes enormously rich. Makkah becomes enormously rich. The one thing that works in Makkah's favor and not in another place, a parts, a country, a city's favor called Najran, is that Makkah was open to all religions. Makkah was open to all religions. Najran was also a center, but it was a center for Christianity. So when you read the surah, what surah is that? وَالسَّمَا إِذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ That particular surah bears testimony to what happened in Najran. Because the king of, the, of Yemen, he, he understood that Najran is competing with us for revenue. And we have, and so he gave them an ultimatum. He says, either you shut down business, you close up your church, Christians, say, eh? close up your church, or we will destroy you. And so they says, no, we're not going to close it up. And so they were destroyed. So that particular surah refers to that incident. And it's obviously told to the people of Makkah to remind them of how their neighbors were destroyed and they were saved. Neighbors destroyed, but they were saved. Get it? And we'll talk about that. There are two surahs in the Quran. You would not understand the beginning of the first, the second surah, unless you read the, the entire first surah first. Uh, the first surah is Surah Al Fil. Alam tara kifa faal ala rabbuka bi ashab al Fil. And then how does it end? Wa jaalahum ka asfim maakul. Limada why? Li ila fi Quraysh. Now, when you take the one top surah and the bottom surah and connect it, it becomes the whole picture comes comes together. We did this with the people of the elephant the people of the elephant, and then the second surah says, so that we could give uh, uh, protection to Quraysh. Li ila fi Quraysh. Ila fi him. To give them security and a sense of well being. That came about only after we destroyed the the, the, the uh the people of 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 of, uh, of the elephant. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I want want to, wanted to put that to, in, in front of you. Any questions? Or all the Islam land 
will be lost. Anyone else? I'm taking a break. Money, Karsh, no, Karsh. It comes from money. So uh, let's move on to the story of the elephant. This is the story about an Abyssinian king, Abraha Ashram, who built an alternative to the Kaaba in the hope that people would gather, come to that place rather than go to the Kaaba. And uh, he was not very successful. You know, he put a new commodity out there. You had uh, what you call that, uh, what's that place out there in, uh, that all the kids go to? What's it called? No, no, here, yeah, down here. Yeah. See the point, right? So he wanted to create an alternative to see the point. So he did. Didn't work. So he says, well, then we have to destroy it. At that point, so many wonderful things happened. So uh, he comes up, brings his elephants with him. Uh, the one thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa grandfather fully understood was that he was no match for, the, for Abraha. That Abraha had the firepower to destroy him. Then he made a very telling comment. He says, this is the house of the Lord. This is the house of Allah. And he will protect it. So even in their moments of ignorance, even when they were misled in terms of belief, they understood the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They understood that he was the ultimate, the omnipotent authority who can change fortunes. So he gets up, he moves away, they all move out of Makkah to see what's going to happen. And obviously this is, <clears throat> this is a journey that takes a while and they get news that you know, Abraha is coming with his elephants and elephants travel pretty slowly, especially in the desert. So it was a, probably a few days before they could get to Makkah when Allah sent, sent down these, uh, these pellets. So, you know, because we're in, in, a, in a world of science today, we say that they were either radioactive or that they were filled with certain germs and bacteria that destroyed the elephants. Because people in the past, it's fascinating, you read the Mufassir in the past, they have to square this idea of how, what kind of a bird do you need to carry a stone that would kill an elephant? You, you, see, you see the, it just it didn't, it didn't, it just struck them at all. I mean, you know, you need massive birds to do this. Because you can't use little pellets. And the Quran actually speaks about pellets. It says, these pellets destroyed them. It says, oh, maybe it must have been a massive bird, massive. Now, in our age, we have a better understanding of it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in fact, points to this. He says, there's some things that will open up to those who come after you. And what you don't understand today, people after you would understand. Like time travel. We have a better understanding of time travel today than people in the past. We understand how time itself changes the further you move away from the earth. Makes a lot of, now it's, it becomes that which was impossible and was, was accepted only on belief. Suddenly we are now in the, in the realm of plausibility. Yes. Yes, it can happen. So in the same way when, when these birds drop their stones there, these things destroy the 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 the, car, the, the, uh, the elephants and the Kaaba is saved. That was for the Quraysh and particularly for the Banu Hashim 
That was like winning the biggest lottery in the world. First of all, they got so much booty from that. Munaf ibn Adi, who was the father of, of Abu Sufyan, became an immensely rich person because of that. Just that particular war. The Banu Hashim became very rich because of that. And their credibility grew manifold. Because now a real religious dimension was added to it. Like you says, no, really, these guys, they have some really good connections upstairs. They have some really good connections. I mean, for those birds to pitch up at that point in time, and for them to drop their load such that these massive Indian elephants could be destroyed, you must have some connection upstairs. So the, the prestige of the Quraysh just grew. So when the Quran reminds them, it starts off about telling them that you, we gave you the security. Then it talks about how your city becomes this area of tremendous commerce. In the winters they go south, in the summers they go north. And our general impression is that, you know, when they go south and they go north, they're probably taking a few things and so on. When Abu Sufyan was making his journey during, just prior to the Battle of Badr, you heard about the story, right? That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had sent out a, 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 a Ghazis to go and attack the, 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 the camels of Abu Sufyan. There were over a thousand camels there. So it was massive. It was massive. And then as, and so all of these trips enriched the people of Makkah. It made them in, in more enormously uh, affluent. So what the, the, the ayah that the brother recited there is precisely applicable to this, that you, were, you are destroying our financial base. You see, you, you see the objection? So the, 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 the Quraysh of Makkah objected, not so much. After all, these people were, were so commercialized that the Kaaba was open to anyone. You can bring a little garden, put it there, it doesn't matter. They were concerned about the knock-on effects on the economy itself. What will it do to the Meccan economy? And they were right. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in several different times reassures them reassures them that you will have so much wealth. You wouldn't know what to do with it. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Now, I want you to, to think about this. When Rasulullah makes this, is he prophesying, in other words, Kannabi? Or is he is an astute businessman who understands that ultimately, the way to make huge amounts of money is through dis disruption. You ask any modern entrepreneur today, he say the more disruptive your product is, the more money you make. The more dis in other words, if, if, if the world, if, if commerce with regard to motor cars, GM, Chrysler, Ford did business in a certain way. Along comes one man with a different idea. He turns the whole thing around. Disruption. Who am I talking about? Elon Musk. Disruption. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reassures them, when he tells them that you will have enormous wealth, is he saying that simply because this is guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he had no idea how it's going to happen? Or he understood that you might suffer in initially? That's a good answer, see? That you might suffer initially, but ultimately your coffers will be so enriched, you wouldn't know what to do with it. 
Huh? Even today. Even today, yeah. So he says both. I think that's a good answer. What we not but let me know if it's time for Asar Adhan, okay? Forty one, okay. Yes, Abu Talib suffered a financial misfortune. But not his brothers. Brothers did very well. And that happens in, you know, you, it, it's not unique to him. He had, he had made an investment. The investment didn't pan out. He lost an enormous amount of money. And, uh, and he was bankrupt. All right? Uh, no, he was he was uh, bankrupt to the point where Ali radiallahu anhu didn't have a house to live in, which is how Ali ended up where in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ali ended up in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because Abu Talib was in dire straits financially speaking. Well, you know, sometimes you could lose your shirt. You know, if you if you make an investment, it's not just intelligence that makes it for you. That's a fascinating thing about business uh, or education. Luck plays a huge role in it. it you know, for you, you have to have a a a. a a kind of coming together of, of multiple strands and luck, what we would, what we would call taqdeer, you know, then it opens up for you. Well, he did that. So he, he engaged in the same business like Abu Lahab and, 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 and so on. But his didn't work out. Sometimes, you know, you, you go, you, you send a camel that you, you send a, a caravan I don't know exactly how he, how he lost all his wealth, but I'll give you an example. If, you know, generally, say, Brother A was accustomed to sending it to, to, to Egypt, and Brother B to Yemen, and so on, and he was accustomed to sending it to Syria. And at that particular moment, the Syrians were attacked by the Persians, and he lost out. Those are unforeseen circumstances. You know, that's, that's beyond your, 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 your ability to, to reckon with. Maybe. More than that. The fact that he's in Makkah means he's part of what kind of a community? A commercial community. You know, you, you people are good examples of this. Many of you have a very deep and deeply grounded training in, in a certain field but you know very little about business. I was told by, 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 by a colleague of mine, he says the worst investors are doctors. Because they assume that their understanding of the human heart or the human kidney empowers them to understand the commercial world and investment. And so they just do it themselves and they lose their shirt. I don't know if that's true or not. And I'm not going to get into this debate. But it is also, it is clearly true that if you come from a family of business people, you come from a city where commerce is, 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 uh, is uh, rampant or rife, then clearly you will, you will also be able to do some things with it. And, uh, and so that's the point, that's precisely the point, that all of this is in preparation for us to understand the other dimension of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those elements that allowed him to speak, as much as I, brought, I, I, I appreciate what the brother said, 
that Allah, that Rasulullah was an heir to both these things. That Rasulullah, when he made these comments about the future of Islam, which at that time was the religion of who? The Ashabu Sufa. It was the religion of the, 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 the downtrodden. He says, no, a time will come. A time will come when you will have unimaginable wealth. I think this is that part of it, which is why I'm focusing on that today. Tonight, if I'm talking, I might talk, focus on the other part. But for now, we are looking at that part where this astute businessman who is a product of a city that, is, that becomes a city-state is able to look into the future with an eye to commerce and see, no, this is, this is an investment worth making. That's the point. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough the need for us to look at Islam in this way. In this modern world, the backbone of, a, an, of, of any country is its economy. And if that economy suffers, everything else suffers. Rasulullah in his own unique way, he kind of encapsulates this. He says, كَادَ الْفَقْرُ أَنْ يَكُونَ كُفْرًا which is a, contra a, a, a total opposition to everything else we know about faqr. That poverty leads to kufr. Our understanding is that faqr is the, 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 is the noble persona of a, a good man. And here the hadith, the hadith is saying quite the opposite. He says, people will ultimately compromise their very own faith because of poverty. Because of poverty. And the reason I think, I've, you know, I've, 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 I chose this in the month of Ramadan, hoping I'd have two or three people sit with me so we can share this. Mashallah, we got a bunch of people who are willing to take this kind of punishment. May Allah reward you for it. Because I, I don't think we understand how important it is for Muslim countries to become economically viable. We focus too much on the politics of the country. The, the, the politics will just follow. The politics will follow. What we need are countries that are economically viable. And we don't have that. We don't have an understanding of how important it is. I listen to my colleagues in, in the Muslim world speaking about Islam. None of them understands this element that if you want Islam to prosper, you want the economy to prosper. You want the economy to prosper. Without a, a vibrant economy, Islam will stumble. Islam will stumble. So that, th this is something that, that, that I've been grappling with for, for many years and you know, I'm coming to terms with that, that we just don't understand how important economic well-being is to Iman, is to Ummah, is to the well-being of the community. Because, and that's to, to, to kind of wrap this up, that's why we, I spoke about this, this singular focus on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as being this exemplar of individual spirituality, not of economic upliftment. And yet everything that happened from the time of Rasulullah onwards, everything led us to greater riches, greater riches, and greater riches. We became enormously rich. Good from that and bad from that. But right now, from all our countries, whether we are out there in Southeast Asia, or we are in South Asia, or we are in the Middle East, or North Africa, we don't understand the importance of economic well-being. And the other thing we don't understand, that economy, the, a good, vibrant economy needs the basic akhlaq of Islam. 
there is no vibrancy in an economy that does not practice honesty. So I'm, I'm, I'm not splitting these things. You have to be every one of us. Every one of us has to have the near that Allah must en enrich us. But we must also be as sadiq and al amin We must be those two. We have to be those two. The irony is that good Western business people, they exemplify these two qualities. Hindus ex exemplify this, this, these qualities. There's a guy there in India who now owns, who now owns, he's actually from Iran. He owns, four, he owns uh, Jaguar and he owns Land Rover and he owns, uh, who am I talking about? Ratan Tata. I know from very, not a close friend of mine, but I know him pretty well. He's an Alim, Maulana, Sajjad, Nomani. He says, I haven't met a more honest person than him, which is both a glowing compliment to the man and an embarrassment for his own community. The man wakes up and he goes to sleep with Muslims. He's an Alim. And he says, I haven't met a man as honest as this guy. Ratan Tata. Being honest? No, no, being business people. Yeah, so they exist. But ultimately, the, the, comb the combination of the two is required. You, have, you can't just be a businessman. Well, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't speak for all of them. But yes, they have, they, they have, they have a legacy of, of, of being, being in business. I say, they, I say this, I'll take your question now. In light of our own community in Southeast Michigan, we're going to jail. We're going to jail in this part of the world. Allah's already given us enough. Enough. What is sending us to jail? Greed. Nothing but greed. Greed is sending us to jail. It's one thing for a, for a poor man to steal. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu during the time of, 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 of a drought, he, he suspended the laws of, 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 of Qisas. He says you, a man has to choose between dying because of hunger and, and stealing. He's not going to be punished. You're a doctor. You're an engineer. Forget about earning a good, good salary. You have enough disposable income. You have assets. Do you want to get involved in these fly-by-night projects? You suffer, your family suffers, and the Muslim community suffers. Greed. There's so much to say about this. You know, we don't focus on these things. So somebody's written a book about the, 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 the origins of capitalism in the West. The origins of capitalism in the West. Generally, when you write about 
history of economics in the West, you, t you trace it back to Martin Luther, and you trace it back to Adam Smith maybe, but it's certainly grounded in Christianity. This guy, his name is Benedict, I think, uh, he traces it back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Straight back to Rasulullah. He says, modern capitalism goes back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can think that way. Again, because we're just using one lens, eh? So we don't understand that Rasulullah was someone with such vision that he could understand what the future is going to hold and how you use that to enrich the community. It's a great book. Uh, there's some parts of it that Muslims will take exception to. Uh, it, uh, and I'm kind of reluctant to recommend it. But it, 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 makes, it makes the connection that whatever you think about as being Western capitalism and the great advancement it has made, it can all go back that way. He has to answer these questions because he says there was this, it, it, there was this thriving in, uh, community in 7th, 8th, 9th century Arabia which didn't exist in Europe. You understand? Europe was, it was stagnant. So what is it that, that gave Europe the boost? It was Italy, it was Genoa. That's where, that's where these, these two civilizations come together. That's where the two civilizations come together. Is that a Azan time? Is it? Okay, we'll break for Azan. And his blood ancestor. And Hussein, we said, was, was singularly important because he, he was the first person to give Makkah a central role that was to grow over time and then become a major center for commerce and trade. And uh, that brought us to Hashim and then to Abdul Muttalib and to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Now with regard to Hashim, very important reforms that, they were, that were put in place and it's hard to believe that Rasulullah was not familiar with it. And these are reforms that you and I live with today. So for instance, we have a social security system in this country, right? Hashim was the first one to implement a social security system in Makkah. The first person to do so. I mean, the, the, the challenges you and I face were the same challenges people faced in the past. Like I mentioned also on, we always have had a challenge dealing with three categories of people in our community. We dealt with them differently, but the categories are still there, and they still remain. The first is the, ch the children, second is women, and the third is the aged. We've always had to deal with them because they are less able to take care of themselves. And they are, they are susceptible to the predatory behavior of people outside and sometimes even people inside. So in order to, to address that, he introduced a, uh, a social security system that required of people, this is what he did. He says, when you go on trade, he's a, he's a big businessman. When he goes on trade, it is required of him that he takes this person with him. Fasahat will have to go with him because he is the other, this, let me explain this to you. In Arab society, you had, uh, you lived in a particular family. And that family belonged to a clan. And then you belonged to a tribe. So you had, you had a family of two people. And then you had multiple such families. Right, can you see that? So that becomes a clan. And then you have multiple clans and that becomes a tribe. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam belonged to the Banu Hashim, right? And then, and, and Uthman radiallahu anhu was an Umayyad, Banu Umayyah. These are different clans. And they all, when you put all the clans together, then you have a tribe. But what if you moved into the neighborhood from Dayton, Ohio? 
What if there was a fire in Toledo? You lost everything. Toledo failed to exist now. So you people move into this area. If it was, a, if it was war, you would be enslaved. Then you would be attached to the Sias. You'd be tr slaves inside it, you understand? That's how slavery, you, you had, you had com commercialized slavery, which is what happened in America. But this was, this was a different, the war-based war slavery, you were slaves who were absorbed into families. What rights are, do we confer on them and how do we do that? How do we empower people? So he wanted to take them away from being dependent to becoming autonomous. That was Hashem. Brilliant guy. He said, how do I, how do I empower him? Send him together. Send him with him. So he's going to do one of two things. You're going to give him seed money so he can do his own trade and pay you back. Or he's going to work for you, earn an amount, and then come the next trade, he's going to have his own stuff to sell. See it? You have to have deep insight to realize that this is a very good way of empowering the community. Instead of, instead of having people who are rich and independent and having a whole lot of people who are dependent, you have to empower everyone. Republicans would just love this, wouldn't they? <laughs> they would love this. But that was, that was the Hashi mentality. He said, that's what we have to do. And that's how he, he would send this. And now you understand where Rasulullah comes in. Now you see the, now you see the story? Tell me the story. Someone, you have to tell me the story. Someone told me already you should talk less. Your voice is starting to go. Come on, you tell me the story. Come on. Who does Rasulullah get married to? Hadija. And who was Rasulullah? An orphan. Remember we said three categories of people. Who was he dependent on initially? Abu Talib. Abu Talib had problems of his own. So he gets mad, he gets, he, he becomes a trader for Khadija. You see the, you see the connection now? And who is, who should we be thankful for that? Who allowed Rasulullah to, to, to be empowered in that way? Hashim goes all the way back there. Hashim instituted this policy of empowering the, 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 the outliers, those on the periphery, in these two ways. So they become empowered and they become part of, 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 of the economy. Our mentality, unfortunately, this because we, we focus too much on this, is we open up soup kitchens, uh, what do they call it in India? Langars. And you know, it's a wonderful thing. I, 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 I traveled with the, sh with, with the sheikh uh, uh, one day and we went all the way to uh, Tajikistan. And he was talking about the amount of bread he distributes in Egypt, in Cairo alone. The number of loaves, tens of thousands of loaves every day. And I obviously have to bite your tongue when you're sitting in the company of big people. And this one, this man was the foremost Qari in, in, in Egypt. So you just respectfully listen to him and say, may Allah reward you. He says, man, you should, have think, you should think about a way of empowering them. Empower them rather than have them come for that loaf of bread every day. And it's also all Islam because what the Rasulullah teaches us. He says, you can come to me every time for, some, for something. I can give you a handout. Or I can give you an ax. I'm not sure if Rasulullah said this or I'm mixing things up. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I can give you an axe, you can do what? Chop your own t wood and sell it. This is that mentality in Islam. That you have to be empowered and you have to provide ways and means for people to become empowered. That's what you have to do. Now you will say, well, that's a good thing. And I'm going to tell you, it is as good a thing as the ibadah you do here. And that's a different thing, difficulty for you to reconcile. You say, well, mashallah, ibadah, you know, you have sukoon al-qalb, and itma'naan, and mashallah, all of these lovely things. Business is just trade. There's no peace and tranquility. It comes afterwards. Has anyone gone on the hajj? You know, the one thing that's furthest removed from you in the, in the hajj is what? 
having that itmanan al qalb and I mean the Hajj there's nothing like that. You realize that? Why? Because you have to go to your haircut, you have to run and catch the bus, do you have enough water? Is there food? I lived in Makkah for many years. That's all you worry about. That is all you're worried about. Am I going to catch my bus? Is my, my booking re, uh, conf confirmation done? What is the role, rule now? What is the mas'ala? Should, can, I, can I throw the stones before uh, 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 Zawal or after Zawal? Mas'ala. That's all you're concerned about. When does the spirituality hit you? For some, when you're sitting in the plane. Long after you've left Makkah, then it all starts settling in. You say, oh, mashallah, wow, that was something. What was that? In all that running around, my bags, my kids behind me, oh, my wife, and taking, you, you know what the hajj is. That's why Rasulullah said the hajj is like jihad for some people. <laughs> because it's all just a frenzy. It's a frenzy, it's a frenzy, it's a frenzy. Business is like that. Think about your status as a as a as someone close to Allah. If you if you are tempted with with somebody who comes with you with a bribe, and you refuse that bribe, think about where you stand. Who do you stand with? Which you understand what I'm trying to tell you? It's a very difficult thing to refuse a bribe. Very difficult. It's a lot of money sometimes. It's, and, and you decide to, to refuse it. What does that tell you about your status? You don't realize that actually this is, I'm, I'm in the ranks of, of the great people of, of, of Islam. Because you haven't made so many rakahs of this, and you understand what I'm saying? You don't see the virtue in honest commerce and trade. You don't see the virtue in, 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 in kind of putting a lock on your own nafs and saying, no, I can't do this can't do this. Which is why you find this contradiction, this nifaq in our communities. Where a person, mashallah, he goes for five umrahs, three hajjahs, all the rest of it, and he's busy in all kinds of haram. There is this kind of, 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 of a schizophrenic approach to, to life. We are very pious on the one. We have ulama in, 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 in Muslim countries holding high positions, and they stand accused of the worst kind of bribes. And, 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 and financial corruption. And if you listen to him read the Quran, he melts your heart. So we have to get past that contradiction of being transparent in our behavior, being transparent in our contracts, in being, in being uh, honest in the way we deal with people. If we don't get to that, there is no barakah. In, ultimately, we don't believe in prophets. We believe in barakah. You can have all the prophets in the world. If there's no barakah in those prophets, it's nothing. That's our iman. One dollar earned here with barakah in it is worth more than a hundred dollars earned there without any barakah in it. And we have examples of that. I'm kind of digressing now. Right in this country, think, just read up on people who won the lottery. You know, people who win big, big bucks, 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. They don't last five years. They don't last five years. The guy who owns a little party store, earns $5,000 a month maybe, he's able to give it over to his son after he dies. That's baraka. So whilst we are encouraged as Muslims to engage in commerce, we have to do that ethically. And at the end of the day, we understand that one, ran, one dollar becomes ten dollars because of barakah. And ten dollars becomes fifty cents because there's no barakah. You just cannot satisfy what you, have, what you need. So Hashim did, he, that's the one thing he did. He put together a social security system. The other is he introduced taxes. One of the first examples we have of, of taxing, taxation. Whenever people used the facilities in Makkah, he would add a tax to that. But it was targeted taxation. It was taxation for people who came in, mostly hujjaj, who came in but could not provide for themselves. 
And so they would just be beggars in the streets of Makkah, and he didn't want that. He was very proud of his city. He didn't want his city filled with people just begging all, the, all, all over. So he says, let's create a fund that would give them a decent hajj or an umrah when they come, in their pagan Islam. But ultimately, some, a visionary who, understand, who understood the need for a, a, a healthy economic system upon which we, the, the Arabian society or Meccan society can function. And then the final thing he did was he set up these regional trade zones. He sent his sons. He sent them out to Syria, to Bahrain, to Abyssinia, and so on, to make connections with them. That's the first thing he did. The second thing he did, he, he got people to, to pool their wares. What people would do is, if you're selling leather jackets, for instance, so you would put up your leather jacket, you'd have a little stall, you'd put all your leather jackets there and sell it to whoever comes by. And he's selling shoes, this one's selling glasses, somebody else is selling, selling furniture. And he says, you're not going to make much money this way. Take all of the stuff, put it together, send it to Syria, or send it to Yemen, and so on. So what has happened is, a small caravan of two people or ten people suddenly became that Abu Sufyan camel, a caravan of a thousand camels. Of a thousand camels. Because all of them now understood, we can sell some stuff here, exactly like the kind of business we do here. Sell some of the stuff here, but take the bulk of it, give it to Abu Sufyan. When he goes to Damascus, we can sell it for you. We take that for granted. That's how commerce operates in the modern world. This is pre-Islamic Arabia. Pre-Islamic Arabia. In a community that is not considered as the heartland of economic development and literacy. There were very astute business people who understood that society has to benefit and the best way for society to benefit is by way of economic development. So that's, that's when you had these brothers take on these positions of authority. And that's how the Banu Hashim became so prominent. Any questions? So what time do you think we should uh, have the class? We have um, Saturday and Sunday, tomorrow. Uh, we could sh shorten it to an hour after Asar. We could lengthen it, whichever one you prefer. 6 p.m. Well, you know, I have a lot of material to cover. So uh, the longer the class, the better for me. Um, well, you know, the, 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 the personal benefit is that as much as I'm teaching you, I'm also learning from you. Because you, the questions you ask me, they, they take me to different places that I have not thought about in the past. Or sometimes you ask me a question, I, the answer I don't have, so I have to go back and look at what, what it is. So it's uh, it's uh, it's inter this is why I, I I appreciate your being here. No, that would be too tight for everyone. They want to sleep and five fifteen for Saturday and Sunday, and then we can go back and then decide what we want to do. Anyone, everyone happy with that? Oh, tomorrow and Sunday. Okay. So uh, we will uh, we will be doing the uh, the four Khalifas, and uh, then we will look at uh, Muawiyah radiAllahu anhu in particular, and uh, and then we can move on to the very. I want to stop right there, I don't want to go too far. Then we can talk about uh, issues pertaining to riba 
issues pertaining to waqf, which is endowments, inheritance, questions you might have about inheritance, how to distribute an estate, uh, and so on. So, uh, so we'll, we, need, we need time to talk about those things. <coughs> With regard to the four, three khalifs, four khalifs, all three followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two of them followed him entirely, and the third one followed him halfway. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he understood the message and implemented his economic policy accordingly. He got it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Rasulullah himself will talk about him in, in, in greater detail, but I simply want to quickly apprise you about the Khalifas. Omar, exactly the same. Let, 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 me, let me give you an, a little example from a story that will point you into a mindset. When, when, uh, uh, when Abu Bakr was Khalifa, he considered himself Khalifa to Rasulullah. Omar Khalifa to Rasulullah. Uthman Khalifa to Rasulullah. Ali Khalifa to Rasulullah. The Umayyads became Khalifa to Allah fil Ard. Do you see the difference? What, what has happened? The, it's, it's, it's a little, little statement, but it opens you, it, it gives you a window into a whole new perspective of how they understand their role. If the one group, these three said Khalifa to Rasulullah, the Khalifas of who? Rasulullah. The Umayyads came and they changed that to Khalifa to? Khalifa to Allah. What does that imply? Uh, no. Yes, you're halfway there. Anyone? Being the prophet themselves. In a very twisted way, that's actually the right answer. <laughs> you see, they wanted to get rid of all the, the, the rules and regulations that accumulated from Rasulullah down to, to, to the Khalifas. You see the difference now? So they just wiped it all out. They wiped it all out, including the ethical principles. They had massive accomplishments. You have to be fair and say, well, did the Umayyads produce a lot? Absolutely a lot. But they entrenched a form of government that was totally at odds with, with their predecessors. The ethics was different. The ethics was different. Like I told you with, 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 uh, previously, there was no difference between that which belonged to the state and that which belonged to the political leader. And that, 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 this, that set the template for Muslim governance all the way to the end of the Ottoman Empire. They all, think of, you know, you, man sanna sunnatan sayyatan, فَعَلَيْهِ وِزْرُهَا وَوِزْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ You establish a, a wrong practice, then you would get the punishment for that wrong practice, as well as those who follow you till the day of Qiyamah. Because once you put that practice in place, it just goes. So if you separate, if, if you, there is no distinction between the the the, the mal al al malik wal mal al dawla you see and that became the template and everything came to be looked at in that light everything was examined in that light so that was the tragedy the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has two parts to his life one in makkah and one in medina 
his life in Mecca is entirely Abrahamic. Except for the fact that he is promising his own people that if you follow me and you accept my message, then Allah will enrich you in ways that are unexplainable. But they were very concerned about all the wealth that was accumulated during this period would be lost. They had, from their perspective, legitimate questions. We have a religious plutocracy here. Multiple religions all sharing their space. If you have the one God controlling the Kaaba, you, you see their point. I, for a moment now, think, put, put on their caps and say, look at, look at what they are, their challenge they're facing. On the one hand, we are saying, you know, these people are just wrong in, 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 in denying Tawheed when Tawheed is so simple and clear to understand. They understood Tawheed and accepted Tawheed. It's the economic implications of Tawheed that unnerved them. They were concerned about how Tawheed is going to affect their financial well-being, primarily. And remember, through the hard work of Husay, Hashim, Abdul Muttalib, Makkah, the small little barren town. Think about the accomplishments. I want, I want you to understand that this implacable enmity towards Rasulullah, it came from some place. It was not just enmity. That Rasulullah was really disrupting society. Really a disruptor. He says, man, this thing's working so well. It's like a well-oiled machine. Don't mess with it. It brings in enormous revenue. Every year people come, they pay homage to the Kaaba, they drop their taxes, they spend. You have a thriving economy, you have very good tourists. Therefore you find they engage in all kinds of deals. He says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, if you want, we worship your God for one year, you worship our God for one year. And he is reassuring them that if you worship the one God, who is not, not my God, he's everyone's God, then Allah will reward you and you will be enriched in ways that are unimaginable. But they couldn't get there. They couldn't get there. That was the crux of the matter there. That was the crux of the matter. And so when the caravan moves to Syria and the Muslims in Medina attack it, that was a massive declaration of war. That was a massive declaration of war. And Rasulullah prompted it. He wanted that to happen. He wanted to, to cut off their supply chain. And it disrupted them. From that battle onwards, it was, it was downwards for Makkah. So if you look at that history from a, an economic perspective, a slightly different picture emerges, I hope. That this attack on this, on this caravan was deliberate. And he, Rasulullah then reassured his companions that your property has been confiscated in Makkah by these kuffar, and you have all the right to go and attack that particular army. And they did. He was, Abu, Abu Sufyan was able to, to, to save the caravan and he sh got away. But the die was cast, the first shot was taken, and people realized from now on, this is going to be the modus operandi. Every time we come north, these guys are going to attack us. Every time we come up, up come north, we're gonna, they're going to attack us. So this was coming back to Makkah, the, the, the effort was spiritual, it was theological, it was focused primarily on getting people to come towards Islam. And the numbers were very small. The numbers were very small. Primarily because most people were afraid of the political power, but also afraid that they're going to lose their 
a source of income. Abbas radiallahu anhu is a very good example of this. You know that Abbas was was part of the the prisoners in, during the Battle of Badr. And uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave him some concessions, but ultimately did, did not accept, uh, to, did not agree to have him freed, and Abbas was then, had to, had to free himself financially. And he paid a huge amount of money. A huge amount of money. Abbas himself was a very rich man. Very rich man. According to some reports, he had about 75,000 pieces of gold coins, dinars. And his business? He was a financier. You know the finances we have today? Very rich people. He was a financier. So must, all of his money was made by way of trade and riba. Trade and riba. So he would invest, but he would also lend. So when the verses of riba were finally revealed and settled, Rasulullah himself made the announcement without talking to Abbas. He says, from this day onward, riba is totally banned, and the first riba that I am going to Expunge is the riba of Abbas. The reason for that was he's such a big financier. But because he's a member of the household, Rasulullah took this liberty and says, we will start with ourselves. We will start with ourselves. We understand that this is a massive financial blow to the entire community. And sacrifices have to be made. So we'll start with ourselves, says Abbas's riba goes first. So the, hence his reluctance to simply join Rasulullah when he got the message. He was fully convinced that my nephew is honest, my ne nephew is trustworthy, and his message is as clear to me as the sunlight out there. But I've got financial dealings I have to worry about. Number two, I'm, I'm going to just jogging your memory with stories that you're familiar with. You know, when Rasulullah was leaving, there was this small drama there, right? What was the drama with Rasulullah and Ali? Anyone remember that? When he was leaving on, on Hijrah, what was the drama? Ali was in his bed and... Exactly. This way, his financial dealings. Some of it was money he kept in trust, and some of it was just business deals. So he needed someone to, to deal with that. And that's where Ali came in. And this is where Ali radiallahu anhu comes in because Rasulullah was so concerned. This is a very important uh, lesson to be learned here. Rasulullah was so concerned about honesty and financial propriety that he, he asked Ali, who was very close to him, <coughs> if he would take on this dangerous task. You must, un you must look at this thing as in its context. On the one hand, he's got this trust. Thank you. 
God's going to sacrifice all the way. He says, you are full of lies, you are full of lies, what are you still going to try to do? You're going to kill him. And I will do. And his relationship to the body of our human life had a lot of lies in the same way. This is very, very interesting. Very interesting. So he agreed. And the only thing that saved him is somebody pulled the, the, the cloth off his face. Remember the story, right? Now the story has been said to us so often that we don't focus on, 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 on the, uh, the, uh, the enormity of Ali's sacrifice at that time. His willingness to lay his life on the line for his cousin, the messenger of Allah, who was being threatened by people who felt that they had no option but to kill him. So he could have lost his life easily. But Rasulullah was so concerned about maintaining trust. Make sure that you give the trust to its actual real people. And he had to exemplify that. So when you have a trust, you have to be very careful with it. You have to be very careful with it. And so he, this was Ali's contribution. But it also points to Rasulullah's role as this trustee. Any questions? No? And that takes us to perhaps the most uh, delicate part of our presentation, which is the second half of Uthman radiallahu anhu's reign. Uthman radiallahu anhu was part of the Banu Umayya and we generally as the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah we have a particular attitude towards the Sahaba and I have to make that clear to you. He says we accept all the Sahaba as being equally just and an example of that is when we narrate a hadith so if a hadith is narrated by someone and it has a chain and there are four people in that chain and that chain ends with a sahabi, then the, uh, the imams of, the had of hadith are, are united in this that we will in interrogate him, we will interrogate him, we will interrogate him, we will not interrogate him. That was a decision we took. You understand that, what I'm saying, right? So he got it from Rasulullah. He got it from Rasulullah. They got it from him. So Fasahat getting it from him, he warrants an interrogation. Is Fasahat honest? Is Fasahat uh, uh, senile? Or is he in his full mental capacity? All of those things, Fasahat will undergo that kind of interrogation. And only when he passes that, will we accept the connection of this hadith from this person, let's call him Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, say Amin, and, 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 and so Fasahat gets it from Allah Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. We will not interrogate Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Even if there is evidence to show that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud actually was, was punished for stealing. Because the Sahaba, I'm not saying Astaghfirullah, not that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud himself was punished. I'm saying Sahaba were found guilty for, for matters concerning theft. They were found guilty of being, of being dishonest in, their, in, in the way they spoke. But this is a, a decision that we took at that time in the second century of the Hijra that we will not interrogate the Sahaba. You must remember that. But that does not mean that the Sahaba were, were like the Anbiya. It's a decision we took. It's what puts at, uh, us at odds with the Shia. 
The Shia do not accept that. We accept it. It's what makes us Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So if you want to know what it is, during that time of in immense conflict that starts off at the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, things got so badly out of hand that eventually the community split into multiple groups. The one group that emerged from that to which we belong is the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And there are two things about this group that makes them unique, the Ahlul Sunnah. One is that they, they draw the line with the companions. They do not interrogate companions. It says, as sahaba kulluhum adul. The second thing is that they base their evidence on text only. It doesn't matter what, who says what, you have to prove it by text. And that text has to go through a process of, of, ratif of rat ratification. It must be ratified. That indeed A met B and B met C and C did hear it from Rasulullah. You understand what I mean by text now? This is what puts us at odds with all the other groups. And there were many groups at that time. So with regard to Hus Ali radiallahu anhu, for instance, we have two, we have three views. One on one extreme, the other on the other extreme, and us in the middle. So the Shia are known for having this very passionate relationship with Ali radiallahu anhu. What we don't know is that there's another group that considers Ali a kafir. And they are, they are Muslims and they live today. Oman is a country of the Ibadis and the Ibadis consider Ali as being outside the fold of Islam. Obviously they, they also choke when it comes to Ali because Ali is Ali. But they, according to their aqidah, if somebody engages in a major sin, he's no longer a Muslim. And when Ali accepted the arbitration with Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, then he engaged in a major sin. So he's outside the fold. So in this, in this schism, schismatic world, where you have firqa here, firqa there, firqa there, the ulama got together and says, how do we save and protect the ummah? And he says, let's make the text the base. That's why it's so important to say it's a hadith of Bukhari, and the hadith is Sahih, and the hadith is Muttasir al-Isnad. All of those things came about because of history. Rasulullah did not appoint Bukhari rahimahullah, or Muslim rahimahullah. This whole chain of, of, of hadith didn't come from Rasulullah. <coughs> the Ahlu Sunnah decided to do that, to protect the 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 the, uh, the knowledge and the personalities of the people at the time. So if you claim that this person was was off the track, you have to prove it, and the way you prove it is to show it by way of evidence. So this text-based evidence, as well as giving the Sahaba this this stamp of approval, is what makes people Sunnis. You get it? Any questions there? These are the two outstanding qualities of being Sunnis. But the conflict it starts itself starts with the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Because during the second half, Uthman ruled for 11 years. The second half of his rule was turbulent. Omar, I told you earlier on, had appointed Muawiyah radiallahu anhu governor of Syria. And during the time of Uthman, it was that he, he told Uthman, his reasons were valid, the consequences were unfortunately very unfortunate. He said, listen, I cannot go on administering the finances of, the, of, of my um, part of the empire in the old traditional way because I have to deal with people in various parts of the world. And he was, you know, giving him the benefit of the doubt, the m amount of money that was coming in was just so enormous that bookkeeping accountancy became enormously problematic. He said, I can't separate the two. So uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, this is probably the, one of the biggest reasons which, which our books don't talk about. The, he said, okay, in that case, you're allowed to do that. When we talk about Uthman and the reasons that he was ultimately assassinated, we look at him giving off pieces of land to his family members like Marwan and so on. And that, that, that was certainly the case. But the, the major issue for the people of Mecca, the people of Medina, and so on, was this 
the, the kind of reign, the kind of control that Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was given and that ultimately blew back on Uthman and he was assassinated, unfortunately, by other companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Time is up. Iftah. Oh, yeah. جزاك الله والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر